Hi, David Ellenstein here, Artistic Director of North Coast Repertory Theater. Thank you for tuning in today to our theater conversations. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. That would help us out a lot. Thank you. Hi, David Ellenstein here. Uh, it is my pleasure today to be joined for a theater conversation by actor and playwright Paul Slade Smith. Uh, we've been lucky enough out at North Coast Rep to do two of Paul's plays. We did Unnecessary Farce a few years back to great success. And uh, we just did The Outsider, uh, Paul's newer play, also to great success. Unfortunately, we had to close early and um, our um, extension week, which was pretty much sold out. We, we were unable to perform, but um, those are the times we're living in. But yeah. I thought this was a great way for us to, um, to meet Paul and, and say hi. We've actually never met face to face, so this is the closest we've come. Huh. So, uh, it's, it's great to, to have you on my screen anyway, Paul. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you first, because Paul is an accomplished actor and has a, a, a really uh, thriving acting career, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I wondered what started you writing plays? Have you always been interested or, or how did that happen? I've always been interested in writing. I think even in high school, I, I did creative writing and in co college I was actually an English major. Um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, th I think actually what, what made me not pursue writing as a career, <laughs> I had a very, for someone who ended up as an actor and a playwright, I had a very sort of nine to five idea of what work was through like in, until I was in my early twenties. And so actually even the idea of pursuing a career as an actor seemed uh, like make believe to me. Like that seemed, the acting seemed like something you did for fun and you know, it was really fun to do at school, but I didn't imagine having a career in it, which is odd because I was, throughout high school, going to see plays at Hartford Stage all the time. I ushered there, you know, so that I could see all the plays for free when Mark Lamos was artistic director at Hartford Stage and, and just was blown away by theater and loved doing theater in school. But in the same way, I couldn't figure out like uh, how you make money as a writer. Like that seemed like a very, you know, unless, you know, like a just uh, a very difficult thing to do. So I, I, I chose acting first because people hire actors <laughs> like more frequently than they hire writers and hire playwrights, I guess. And then it was just a matter of, uh, it was just acting and show after show after show after show after show and sort of, uh, you know, again, I did not study theater. I, I, um, so I learned by doing and I learned acting by doing and by learning acting by doing, I was also in a sense learning playwriting, you know, I was learning uh, the, uh, the shape of a play and the drive of a play and character, uh, char you know, action through characters. And um, and so then I just had an impulse. Uh, I was actually touring in Phantom of the Opera. Um, my first time as an actor, I'd, so I'd, I lived for about 15 years in Chicago uh, working um, as an actor there. And that's all regional theaters, like your theater. So it's, you know, they do five shows in the season or whatever. So you you rehearse a show, you open a show, and it's almost as soon as you open, if not before that, you're thinking, okay, what's my next job gonna be? So you're either in rehearsal or you're just about to go in rehearsal. You're just, it's a constant, you know, all day long work um, scene with no downtime to think about writing a play. I went on the road with Phantom of the Opera and suddenly I only had one job to do, <laughs> which I was doing eight times a week and my days were free. And uh, so I just had an impulse to, write Unnecessary Farce, which, um, uh, and I just had the time to experiment and no pressure on myself to succeed or to do it in any time frame. Um, so it was your first play, Unnecessary yeah. Farce? Yeah, I, I, I wrote a play called Him and Carol when I was uh, in my mid twenties, which was really just a case of uh, an artistic director, you know, a, a bunch of us in the, in the in the non-professional amateur theater, basically, or where you're getting $10 a show or whatever. It's not, you know, bef before my days in the union and a friend ran a theater and they had like a late night slot open 
during the Christmas season. He said, you want to do just you know, like, would you like to direct just like a, a bunch of people singing Christmas songs or something? And I said, well, how about I write something? So him and Carol was a, a play that I wrote sort of around Christmas songs being sung, but without any, again, like my youth at that time, no thought about writing a play that anyone would want to do in the future. Just let's write something that will do this November and December and that'll be it. Um, so, and it had no, it didn't really have a plot. It was just sort of a, but so yeah, Nessary Farce was my first time sort of taking on a, a plot and characters and. So, so how many playwrights can say that the first full length play that they ever wrote has been performed, what, 275 productions now? Yeah, I think it might hit 300 this year or perhaps would, would have hit 300 this year for, for not. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. I understand because it's so funny. I mean, it's right. a. I mean, if, as long as you've got a decent company to do it, it's going right. to be it because audiences have such a good time with it. Thanks. Um, if my audience remembers, uh, if they don't remember the title, they probably remember the Scottish Hitman. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody forgets the Scottish Hitman. <laughs> so we had so much fun with that. And then, how? So how did then the Outsider come about? I know it was first called uh, a real Lulu. Yeah, in its it first was incarnation. Right, yeah, I, because when I set out to write that, I was really kind of setting out to write another farce. And that's how a uh, Real Lulu fit more, you know, in the unnecessary farce mode. And then once we produced the play as a Real Lulu, you know, um, I, uh, oh, it's just a second, I'm gonna release my dogs from the office. I'll okay. You wanna go home? All right. We're now witnessing Paul releasing his dogs. Really? <laughs> Release sounds. Who, 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 who let the dogs out? I did. Um, uh, uh, what was your question? Oh, yeah, how did the outsider come about? Yeah, so I, um, so I wanted to write a play, but I, it was in, it was, it was the second production of a necessary farce. I was, um, I was in the audience of, you know, it was, it was a very successful production. Um, in the audience. Uh, that laugh and laugh and laugh for the whole evening and sort of put myself by the exit surreptitiously to listen to people as they headed out. And they were talking about, you know, what they were doing tomorrow or, you know, buying groceries or something like they weren't talking about the play. Like they, they loved it for the whole, you know, uh, two hours, but they, then they were ready to move on with life. And I thought, well, I want to write something that sticks with people longer. You know, I want to write something that is both funny, but also, means something. And that's how uh, The Outsider came about. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, I, it was only the second plot play I wrote and I learned in writing that play how fortunate I was in picking Unnecessary Farce. Unnecessary Farce, in a matter of a half an hour or less, I thought, uh, let's say it's a motel. Let's say it's two rooms in a motel, and let's say it's a sting operation, and there's cops in one room, and there's crooks in the other. And by the time I'd said that, which was like probably as long as I just said that, I had the whole plot. Right. And, I mean, I didn't know who the crooks were, or what the crime was, or what the challenges for the cops would be, or how they would overcome them, or you know, in what order. I had to come up with all that. How many donuts they would eat. Or how many donuts, exactly. But I had a basic plot, whereas The Outsider, I sort of came at it with a, an idea, like a, a thing I wanted to say, a message. And uh, it took me a long while to realize, oh, I was really lucky with the first play that I had a plot before I put pen to paper. And, and you know, next time, <laughs> come up with your plot first before you, I think, who is it? I think it's John Irving, the novelist, who says he never starts a novel before he knows the last sentence. Interesting. Um, and I think that's a, that's a message for me going forward to have the whole shape. So The Outsider was a long gestation. Uh, obviously, I'm thrilled with the end result. And so were we. I got, I got to say, as much fun and as big a success as Unnecessary Farce was, and you know, it was a delight to do and to put on here, and the audience has had a great time, I would say you did take a next step with the yeah. outsider and you wrote a really not just a really funny play because I'd say it's as funny as yeah as a unnecessary farce yeah. but it's also people think about it as you said I, I had somebody say to me the other day in fact um 
who had seen the play, they said, every time now they watch a politician on TV, they wonder who's holding up the cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a, we have friends in Southern California who came to see, I think they have a friend in the cast. They actually saw your final dress rehearsal. Okay. And uh, his two teenage boys, like watching the debate, you know, uh, later that week or something, were color calling out the colors of the car, <laughs> yellow, blue, green, as they as they came out with their with their talking points. Yeah. Right. So, are you writing it? Uh, have you written anything since, or are you I working on something? So I, I, it all it takes it takes me having sort of the space, you know. And I've just I had the amazing eighteen month experience of playing Willy Wonka in the Australian production of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of roles that have sort of taken a lot out of me, but playing that role in that adaptation of the show, just that was all I could do. You know, that, that and just enjoy being in Australia. And so there was, I didn't have the, writing while acting, which I do all the time out of necessity, uh, because it's often acting that's paying the bills, um, uh, uh, is something that I bring the play I'm writing with me to the theater, whether literally, sometimes literally, you know, in the dressing room, I have the notebook and I'm, I'm still rewriting a scene. But if not that, it's at least in my head. And Willy Wonka was a role, which gratefully, you know, I say that, that I, once the show began, that was all I could think of was, was what I was doing. And how did that come to be? I, you were in the Broadway production? Broadway production? Uh, uh, yeah, I was in the original Broadway cast, and I was uh, one of two understudies of, of Willy Wonka, and um, uh, that was a great experience. And, uh, and we closed in January 2018, and I went off and did another show. I was doing My Fair Lady at Lincoln Center. And eight months later, later, completely out of the blue, without any uh, pre-warning, came an email saying, you know, would you be interested in being considered to play the role of Willy Wonka? So the, the, the original team, Jack O'Brien, and the whole original team from the New York production uh, were also artistically in charge of the Australian production. And Jack and, uh, and his team remembered me from the Broadway production, and I'm flattered to say that they thought, "Oh, you know, let's bring Paul along with us." So that was a really—it was—it was me and, a, and an amazing Australian cast, and it was—it uh, was the most rewarding, you know, acting job I've ever had. Well, that's great, and you did it for 18 months. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I, I was an actor for a long time before I became an artistic director, but I never did a show for anywhere near that long. I, yeah. What, what, how do you do it? How do you stay fresh? How do you stay um, alive and yeah. in the moment when you're doing a play yeah. for 18 months? You know, I, 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 have an, I have an answer, which is a completely honest answer, but I must acknowledge that I don't think it works for everybody. Okay. It just so happens that the way I am wired, I played uh, Dr. Dillamond in the National Tour of Wicked for three and a half years, and I never tired of telling that story fresh every night like it was every night um you know when i write a play when it, when i'm in the the first audience of unnecessary farce i sit in the audience really nervously having no idea how the audience is going to respond to the story you know but hoping that the story tells itself and that they understand and they they move on to page five and they get on to page 10 and they're with me to the next scene I am the same way as an actor. I sort of, I assume, even if it's wicked, even if it's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I, I assume that it's, that it's an audience full, it's 2,000 people out there who have no idea what the story is and who need to be taken along from step, step, step. And for me, it's just, it's a rewarding, yes, they got that. Yes, they came with me on that. Yes, they're getting this. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a, my job is to tell the story every night. And I, I, I I say, for me, it's akin to if you're a great storyteller, which I'm not, actually, ironically, I'm really bad. The Smiths are really bad at telling stories. We take way too long to get to the point, as I'm perhaps doing right now. But, um, but uh, uh, if you're really, like, if you know friends who are really great at telling stories, there's some story that happened when they went on a camping trip to Grand Canyon or whatever, and every time they tell it, they know how to tell it well and how to set it up, and then, you know what I mean? And they love telling it every time because they love the reaction it gets every time. And for me, that's what acting is. It's like, it's, it's a story you love telling 
that you know has a great impact, whether comedic or otherwise, on people. And it's just, it's just you, but you know that if you don't tell it with enthusiasm, then it's not going to go over well. You know that if you don't, if you mumble the words, then they won't go over well. You know, like all of the jobs you have to do as an actor are important to tell the story well. And that's just your, that's your simple job every night. Well, you're downplaying your ability to tell a story, but your two oh, plays I certainly tell stories well. <laughs> so I'm curious because both of your plays are so funny and they are so smart and the, the, uh, the humor is so um, unexpectedly funny. I mean, the things that make you, where's that come from in you? Where does it come from your upbringing, your family, or just, just uh, being an observer? I uh, the this, this Smith, it's a, it's a funny family that we're, we're, when, we're, when we get together, um, uh, there's a lot of laughs. You know, it's a very, it's a very funny, we, so I come from funny genes, I guess. Um, but, but I have realized since writing, you realize so many things about yourself, like in real life. And I've realized that the, um, that irony, or at least it's the, it's the, the whole, well, I've said, I said a while ago or, or wrote or read somewhere that comedy is contrast and contrast is comedy. Um, I, and, and I think that comedy can really be broken down to that simple idea of you expect this, but you get this. Almost like every comedic moment or joke or that you can think of is, is that idea of opposite, basically. And I realized that my brain is just entertained by that constantly. So I'm... So uh, I, if I'm funny in a room, if I'm funny, you know, at a party, if I'm funny with friends, it's because someone says something and just my brain occurs, you know, it's just something in my brain goes, oh, well, you know, the complete opposite interpretation of that or whatever to say that out loud. And, you know, I think that's, so that's how these plays come about. It's, it's, uh, and in both Unnecessary Farce and The Outsider, I realized after writing my second play, I was writing about people who are, um, I think I say of, of Billy Dwyer, one of the two cops uh, in Unnecessary Forest, that she's seems uh, destined, she's seems destined to fail, but but her enthusiasm, something about, but her, you know, but she, like she has the enthusiasm that she believes she's gonna succeed, but she's destined to fail. And I think I, I'm drawn to those characters which are, have the same thing. They have the opposite that you expect this of Eric and Billy, the two cops in the nursery first, but they end up winning. You, you know, it's, it's very funny that you said that because the actor, actor who played Billy in our production of Unnecessary yes. Farce is the same actor who played Lulu. There you go. Well, that, that's, yeah, that's not <laughs> in, the, my, the wife, my wife originated both those roles. Well, that, there uh, we go. Well, yeah. that makes 100% sense then, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so even in Shakespeare, you know, if, even when he's doing drama, antithesis is what he talks about all the Absolutely. time. The one thing, again, a set off against the other creates Absolutely. drama or creates comedy. Exactly. Kind of the same thing that you're saying for this. Yes, I did a, I did a, a production, a great production of Comedy of Errors at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, and it was a director, David Bell. Yeah. Who, who had a, I had a conversation, I love as an actor in a room, even if I'm not in the scene, listening into conversations between directors and actors. I learned so much by just being on the periphery. Uh, and I love direct, I love great directors and I love great actors. And so it, I just like to hang around. And so he wasn't talking to me, he was talking to Antipholus and Romeo, but he was saying, look, uh, um, Romeo and Juliet, Comedy of Errors, they're the same play. It's like, think uh, they, if you if you just take a different turn, you know, like it's the same, the same thing. It's like it's like you know, it's conflict. It's it's you know, but it just like one takes a turn this way and the other takes a turn this way. Right. And it's yeah, it's antithesis. Yeah, yeah. So you're having um, quite a successful career as an actor, right? Which is yeah. awesome. And congratulations. And you. you're having quite an amazing success as an author of two plays that yeah. are both hits, yeah. as it were. Can you talk a little bit about the different kind of satisfaction you get from each? What, the kind of satisfaction you get from, from being an actor and having a successful career as an actor, yeah. as opposed to the satisfaction you get from seeing your plays being received the way they are? Well, th to, put it in the, to put it in the simplest way, uh, being a successful actor is a lot more uh, sort of constant footwork, you know, to get the next job and to, um, 
but at the same time, it's a lot more um, when you're working, it's a lot more frequent, uh, you know, um, rewards, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, being Willy Wonka was, you know, five rewards a page, you know, whereas, whereas, uh, um, you know, my wife, as I say, who, who has been in the, uh, the premier productions of both of my plays has observed that as a playwright, even when I have been there for nights one, two, and three, and they went, you know, like gangbusters, they were rock concerts. I still come to night four, just all <laughs> tense, <laughs> you know, because I need, I need everything to work. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, it's, a, it's a, it's a need and it's, a, it's, I don't feel, it's not, it's never relief, I think, from the first page to the last, uh, w watching my plays. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think, I think, you know, being an actor is a lot looser, you know, it's a lot to, a lot less is riding on you, you know, you only have to tell the one story as opposed to telling all the stories. Um, and, you know, in being, getting employment as an actor is walking into a room and solving the one problem that they have, you know, it's like we need somebody to, oh yes, there is the solution to our problem. You know, there, this is the person that fills that hole. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the, the requirements of a playwright are just, um, <laughs> just really big. <laughs> well, that's what I always say to my cast when I direct a play, they say, when are you going to come back and see it? I say, you don't want me to come back. And see it. I'm only going to see what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Their yeah. audience is going to be laughing and having a great time, but I'm only going to see what you missed. You don't want yeah. me there. <laughs> you and I would be exactly the same way, David. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So what's next for you? Do you, I mean, I mean, no, I know we're all on um, unexpected hiatus currently, we are. but, but um, do you have um, things lined up for once uh, we can get back to work? I, I don't have any I, uh, more acting gigs. You know, I always say when a play closes, um, I will never work again. So I'll never work again as an actor. Um, but it was fun while it lasted. But, uh, but the good news is being stuck at home uh, is a perfect uh, time to write. And I, I'm very fortunate that while I was in Australia, I, I came up with two, two ideas, which I don't think I've ever had before, for, to write the next play. Um, and one of them is a period piece, and I won't say more than that, but I haven't ever written a period piece before. Um, and I think I'm gonna go with that one because the other one, like The Outsider, is contemporary and reflects on today's society. And I think to myself, I don't know what today's society is. Like when we get out of this in November, or December, or whenever, I don't know that, I think I have to be in that environment in order to write about that environment. Yeah, I don't want to get maudlin or sad or or get bogged down in what's going on, but it is an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, our whole business is about people gathering together in a small yeah. room. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're not allowed to do right now. And, yeah. and um, that's my concern. I mean, I know we're going to get through this and we're going to come back strong, but yeah. people, people relaxing enough so that they feel comfortable to come back and crowd together to watch yeah. the art form that we create. Because what we're doing right now is not the art form that you and I work no. in. No. Um, I, I keep saying to people, I'm turning into Dick Cavett. And that wasn't my intention, you know? <laughs> I, 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 want, I, like, I love live theater and creating live theater and, and um, yeah. getting, our, getting the audience to relax enough to come back together after we're past this crisis is gonna right. be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah I, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what comes next for the world. But I'm hoping that in this time that we're all shedding ourselves inside, um, the scientists help us figure out, you know, how what what the next steps are, you know, right. what, uh, yeah, whether it's allow, you know, I think, you know, that I mean, now I now I'm just going down a road I know nothing about, but the whole idea that they can that might be a test that shows whether you have the antibodies, you know, that you've already been exposed to the virus and therefore you're immune and right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know uh, what comes next um, or when it comes next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said, I don't want to get maudlin about this. Yeah. You know, you and I um, have the first a number conversation I've had that hasn't been <laughs> like four friends who haven't seen each other forever talking about nothing but the coronavirus. So I think well, we're, we're doing I, really I know. That's what's going on with most people. That's why these, these conversations I'm having with theater artists, I'm trying to keep them about the art right. because yeah. we're going to be back. 
Yes, you exactly. Know? And so keeping people engaged with us is really important. Yeah, yeah. You and I have a number of friends in common, people that we've worked with, I know, which is how I originally got a hold of the script for Unnecessary Farce with, a, I believe it was through Meredith K. Clark, who, who you did um, Wicked with for a while. And yeah. I know we have friends from Jackie Ritz and people from Chicago that we have in common. So yeah. I, but this is actually the first time you and I are ever talking. We've, <laughs> we've emailed back and forth quite a bit, but yeah. we haven't actually looked into each other's faces, even though electronically. And talk right. about, I, I'm thrilled that you agreed to do this. And I hope when you get your next play written, if it isn't going straight to Broadway, uh, you'll give uh, me a chance to read it and hopefully we can present it here because my audience has loved your two other plays. Well, and your audience can thank you, David, because you were on me about producing The Outsider very early on, I think maybe even before its first production. And I- you know, Called Lulu. Yeah, yeah. And I asked to be patient because I did rewrites before the second production. And But uh, um, your persistence is much appreciated. And I, I loved being able to say to you, yes, go and 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 be the you know be the pioneer that heads off and 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 does this play now that it's published well well not only um are the friends that we have in common really great people yeah and I so agree. that that was a high recommendation of you but reading your scripts you know your wit and your heart and your um outlook for the world comes through in those plays. And so that's why I was immediately attracted to them. And it only took one read of each when I, I read Unnecessary Farce. I said, oh, we should do this. And I read The Outsiders. I think at intermission, I knew. Once, once uh, what was it? Well, certainly when it got to uh, AC and Ned mumbling to each other, I went, we're doing this play. We, we are doing this play. <laughs> I think I'd already decided, but when we came to that moment, I knew it. <laughs> that, that's the joy of playwriting that you mentioned that moment because there's two characters in The Outsider, for those who haven't seen it, um, who have difficulty communicating. And I didn't know before I got to that moment that there would be a moment between the two of them or what it had to be. You know what I mean? Like it was, it, there's so many things that occur to me pretty much at the same time that they occur to the audience when they're watching it. You know, when I first, I was like, oh, you know, I came there, I was like, oh yes, I have to have a moment where these two men are left alone on stage and neither of them says anything to each other. And yet they're somehow having a conversation. Well, in rehearsal, my two actors, I had a wonderful cast. Yeah. My two actors were not sure about that moment and what to do with it. And they were like, well, can we just do it short? Do we have to? I said, no, 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 you don't get it. This is why I picked the play. <laughs> <laughs> you have to trust that this is, and then, as, of course, as the run went on, they found it more and more and more and more with the audience cueing them in, as it were, <laughs> how, how funny and uh, unexpected and outlandish and real that moment yeah. is. Yeah. And, and, and sorry, I just have to go on a little bit more about The Outsider. And then when <laughs> our verbose character, right, Arthur, yeah. starts to, it starts to happen to him. <laughs> it's, it's a huge payoff. Right. And they didn't get that at first, but they found it. They found it big time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, what a pleasure to talk to you. I thank you so much for having this conversation and sharing this with my audience so they get to know you a little bit. And um, I'm no. hoping that our, our relationship continues um, down the I road here and maybe good. we'll even be in the same state at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's in sunny California because it looks lovely there. Well, next time we do one of your plays, maybe you'll come out. Uh, yes, that sounds great. Let's do that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, David, thanks so much.